Hello YouTube and thank you for tuning in today. We've got Jim Butcher's Grave Peril. This is book three of the Dresden Files. If you've missed um, the other chapters or the other books, please do look in the playlist below because today we're actually starting out on what looks like chapter 12. I stopped outside the doorway. Mickey Malone owned a nice house. His wife taught elementary school. They wouldn't have been able to afford the place on his salary alone, but together they managed. The hardwood floors gleamed with polish. I saw an original painting, a seascape, hanging on one of the walls of the living room adjacent to the entryway. There were a lot of plants, a lot of greenery that, along with the wood grain of the floors, gave the place a rich organic glow. It was one of those places that wasn't just a house. It was a home. Come on, Dresden, Rudolph snapped. The lieutenant is waiting. Is Mrs. Malone here? I asked. Yes. Go get her. I need her to invite me in. What? Rudolph said. Give me a break. Who are you? Count Dracula? Dracul is still in Eastern Europe. Last time we checked, I replied. I need her, or Mickey, to ask me in, if you want me to do anything for you. What the hell are you talking about? I sighed. Look, homes, places that people live in and love and have built a life in, kind of have a power of their own. If a bunch of strangers had been trooping in and out all day, I wouldn't have any trouble with the threshold. But you're not. You guys are friends. Like Murphy said, this one is personal. Stallings frowned. So, you can't come in? Oh, I could come in, I said. But I'd be leaving most of what I can do at the door. The threshold would mess with me being able to work any forces in the house. What shit? Uh, Rudolph snorted. Count Dracula. Harry, Stallings said, can't we invite you in? No. Has to be someone who lives here. Besides, it's polite, I said. I don't like to go to places where I'm not welcome. I'd feel a lot better if I knew it was all right with Mrs. Malone for me to be here. Rudolph opened his mouth to spit venom on me again, but Stallings cut him off. Just do it, Rudy. Go get Sonia and bring her back here. Rudolph glowered, but did what he was told, going into the house. Stallings tapped out a cigarette and lipped up, lit up. He puffed for a second thoughtfully. So you can't do magic inside a house unless someone asks you in? Not a house, I said. A home. There's a difference. So what about Victor's self place? I hear you took him on, right? I shook my head. He'd screwed up his threshold. He was running a business out of it, using the place for dark ceremonies. It wasn't his home anymore. So you can't mess with anything on its own turf? Can't mess with mortals, no. Monsters don't get a threshold. Why not? How the hell should I know, I said. They just don't. I can't know everything, right? I guess so, Stallings said. And after a minute, he nodded. Sure, I see what you mean. So it kind of shuts you down. Not completely, but it makes a lot harder to do anything. Like wearing a lead suit. That's why vampires have to keep out. Other nasties like that. If you give them that much of a handicap, they have trouble just staying alive, much less using any of their freaky powers. Stalling shook his head. This magic crap. I never would have believed it before I came here. I still have trouble with it. Yeah? That's good. Means you aren't running into too much yet. He blew out twin columns of smoke from his nostrils. Could be changing. Last couple of days, we've got some people gone missing. Bums. Street people. Folks that some of the cops and detectives know. I frowned. Yeah? Yeah. It's all rumors so far. And people like that, they can just be gone the next day. But since I started working SI, stuff like that makes me nervous. I frowned and debated telling Stallings what I knew about Bianca's party. Doubtless, there would be a whole flock of vampires in from out of town for the event. Maybe she and her flunkies were rounding up hors d'oeuvres, but I had no proof of that. 
For all I knew, the disappearances, if they were disappearances, could be related to the turbulence in the Never Never. So if the cops couldn't do anything about it, and if it was something else, I could be starting a very nasty exchange with Bianca. I didn't want to sick the cops on her for no reason. I'm pretty sure Bianca had the resources to send them back at me. And she could probably make it look like I'd done something to deserve it, too. Besides that, in the circles of the supernatural community, an old world code of conduct still ruled. When you have a problem, you settle it face to face, within the circle. You don't bring in the cops and other mortals as weapons. They're the nuclear missiles of the supernatural world. If you show people a supernatural brawl going on, it's going to scare the snot out of them, and the next thing you know, they're burning everything and everyone in sight. Most people wouldn't care that one scary guy might have been right, and the other was wrong. Both guys are scary, so you ace both of them and sleep better at night. It had been that way since the dawn of age of reason and the rising power of mortal kind. And more power to the people, I say. I hated all these bullies, vampires, demons, and bloodthirsty old deities rampaging around like they ruled the world. Never mind that, until a few centuries ago, they really had. In any case, I decided to keep my mouth shut about Bianca's gathering until I knew enough to be certain either way. Stallings and I made small talk until Sonia Malone appeared at the door. She was a woman of medium height, comfortably overweight and solid looking. Her face would have been gorgeous when she was a young woman, and it still carried that beauty, refined by years of self-confidence and steady reliability. Her eyes were reddened and she wore no makeup, but her features seemed composed. She wore a simple dress and a floral print, her only jewelry the wedding band on her finger. Mr. Dresden! She said politely. Mickey told me that you saved his life last year. I coughed and looked around. Though I guess that was true, technically, I still didn't see it that way. We all did everything we could, ma'am. Your husband was very brave. Detective Rudolph said that I needed to invite you in. I don't want to go where I'm not welcome, ma'am, I replied. Sonia wrinkled up her nose and eyed stalling. Put that out, Sergeant. Stallings dropped the cigarette and mushed it out with his foot. All right, Mr. Dresden, she said. For a moment, her composure faltered and her lips began to tremble. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath, soothing over her features, then opened her eyes again. If you can help my Mickey, please come in. I invite you. Thank you, I said. I stepped forward through the door and felt the silent tension of the threshold parting around me like a beaded curtain rimmed with frost. We went through a living room with several cops, people I knew from SI, sat around talking quietly. It reminded me of a funeral. They looked up at me as I went by and talk ceased. I nodded to them and we went past, to the staircase leading up to the second floor. He was up late last night, she told me, her voice quiet. Sometimes he can't sleep, and he didn't come to bed until late. I got up early, but I didn't want to make wake him, so I let him sleep in, Mrs. Malone stopped at the top of the stairs and pointed down the hall at the closed door. The, there, she said. I'm sorry, I, I, I can't. She took another deep breath. I need to see about lunch. I, is anyone hungry? Oh, sure. Yeah. All right, she said and retreated down the stairs. I swallowed and looked at the door at the end of the hall and then headed toward it. My steps sounded loud in mine own ears. I knocked gently on the door. Karen Murphy opened it. She wasn't anyone's idea of a leader of a group of cops charged with solving every bizarre crime that fell between the lines of the law enforcement. She didn't look like someone who would stand with her feet planted, putting tiny silver bullets into an oncoming freight train of a loop guru, either. But she was. Karen looked up at me from her five foot nothing in height. Her blue eyes, normally clear and bright, looked sunken. 
She'd shoved her golden hair under a baseball cap and wore jeans with a white t-shirt. Her shoulder harness wrinkled with the cotton around the shoulder where her sidearm hung. Lines stood out like cracks in the sunbank field around her mouth. Her eyes. Hi, Harry. She said. Her voice was too quiet. Too gruff. Hiya, Murph. You don't look so good. She tried to smile. It looked ghastly. I... I didn't know who else to call. I frowned, troubled. On any other day, Murphy would have returned my mildly insulting comment with compounded interest. She opened the door farther and let me in. I remembered Mickey Malone as an energetic man of medium height, balding, with a broad smile and a nose that peeled in the sun if he walked outside to get his morning paper. The cane and limp were additions too recent for me to have firmly stuck in my memory. Mickey wore old, quality suits and was careful never to get the jackets messy or his wife would never let him hear the end of it. I didn't remember Mickey with a fixed, tooth-bearing grin and eyes spread out in a helter-skelter gleam of madness. I didn't remember him covered in small scratches or his fingernails crusted with his own blood, or his wrists and ankles cuffed to the iron-framed bed. He planted, grinning around the neatly decorated little room. I could smell sweat and urine. There were no lights on in the room, and the curtains had been drawn over the windows, leaving it in a brownish haze. He turned his head toward me, and his eyes widened. He sucked in a breath and threw back his head in a long, falsetto-pitched scream like a coyote. Then he started laughing and rocking back and forth, jerking on his steel restraints, making the bed shake in a steady, squeaking rhythm. Sonia called us this morning, Murphy said, toneless. She'd lock herself, locked herself into her closet and had a cellular we got here right before Mickey finished breaking down the closet door. She called the cops? No. She called me. She said she didn't want them to see Mickey like this. That it would ruin him. I shook my head. Damn brave lady. And he's been here like this ever since? Yeah. He was just... crazy. Screaming and spitting and biting at everything? Has he said anything? I asked. Not a word, Murphy said. Animal noises. She crossed her arms and looked up at me, and my eyes for a second, before looking away. What happened to him, Harry? Mickey giggled and started bouncing on his hips and down on the bed as he rocked, making it sound as though a couple of hyperkinetic teenagers were copulating there. My stomach turned. No wonder Mrs. Malone hadn't been willing to come back into this room. You'd better give me a minute to find out, I said. Could he be, you know, possessed? Like in the movies? I don't know yet, Murph. Could it be some kind of spell? Murphy, I don't know. Damn it, Harry, she snapped. You'd damn well better find out. She clenched her fists and shook them with suppressed fury. I put my hand on her shoulder. I will. Give me some time with him. Harry... I swear, if you can't help him... Her voice caught in her throat, and tears sparkled in her eyes. He's one of mine, damn it. Easy, Murphy, I told her, making my voice as gentle as I knew how. I opened the door for her. Go get some coffee, all right? I'll see what I can do. She glanced up at me and then back at Malone. It's okay, Mickey, she said. We're all here for you. You won't be alone. Mickey Malone gave her that fixed grin and then licked his lips before bursting out in another chorus of giggles. Murphy shivered and then walked out of the room, her head bowed, and left me alone with the madman. Thank you very much for listening to Chapter 12 of The Dresden Files, Grave Peril, Book 3. If you liked that, please do give me a thumbs up, like, subscribe, let others know about our channel, and keep on spreading. The likes and subscriptions help let us know that you do want to hear more of these, and this is the type of things that you like to hear. 
Um, thank you very much for listening to my YouTube channel today. And you guys have a great and wonderful day.